This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. We uh, have a, one more class actually this Wednesday. It's going to be a, a, a review session for you uh, prior to the final. So this is the last lecture uh, uh, today. It's some, somewhat nostalgic since it's my last lecture period. And, uh, so what's next? Uh, Tanzania, skiing, uh, fighting, uh, my, fighting this battle, continuing to fight this battle against big tobacco. So I'll tell you about that. But uh, the young lady who's going to be teaching this class, I think she's here, Lisa, will be taking over. And we have a special guest today that I just came up, Howie. Howie Rosen. Uh, I was at Channing's first lecture. That's not quite He was almost at the first E20 lecture 30, 30 years ago. I was having, uh, uh, I think, dinner at Stern or Wilbur? Wilbur, with our daughter, who's now 37, just sitting here on my chest, uh, drooling. And this sort of scrawny guy walks up and says, I, I want to be a chemi. That was Howie. And look at him. He's still, scrawny. still scrawny. <laughs> uh, still a chemi. Uh, uh, has had an illustrious uh, and interesting career. The most, not the most recent, but one of the most recent was he was president of the Alza Corporation, which is, I think, ostensibly the largest controlled drug delivery company in the world. And uh, most recently at Gilead Sciences, and most recently spending lots of time with his twins, um, being a dad. So, Howie's a great role model, and you ought to introduce yourself to him when you get up, because you someday could be Howie. I can't imagine actually Theo in 30 years <laughs> sitting, he'd probably be in handcuffs, <laughs> but other than that. Uh, uh, I want to thank the Peanut Gallery for uh, all the help that you guys have been uh, this, uh, uh, this quarter. And uh, so let's get started. I, uh, let's do two minutes down memory lane. So what was the first lecture? Flow sheets. Flow sheets and then flow sheets, you did what? Perry's. 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 You always say that. That's <laughs> <laughs> been a huge impression on you. Then we went where? Units, and then, in fact, I had, can you believe it, a meeting today with Scott Hubbard, who is a director of NASA, and he knows Glenn Cunningham, my high school roommate, that did the Mars orbiter that never made it because of the unit conversion. He started crying, well, because it was like a $2 billion mistake over con converting CGS to foot, you know, foot pound system. So it still bothers him, which is good, since it was all our money. And after Eunice, we went to apheresis and learned mass balances. <laughs> and then after apheresis, we did what? We designed a, a high, high, high fructose corn syrup plant. And uh, that not only had um, mass balances in it, but it had two other things, reaction. chemical reaction, Recycle. And then we went and said there's a heat exchanger in there, and we went and did energy balances, and uh, we did heat exchangers. And then from there we went to scaling, right? Why you can't make giant chickens. Uh, why fleas can jump nine times their body length. Uh, why ants can't breathe if they're made giant because they're based on diffusion. So we learned about scaling and what theorem? And Bucking and Pike theorem. That allows us to reduce the number of variables to a minimum number so that we can make life much easier for us in understanding complex physical problems. And then we sh went f to where? What was our next transition? Can we Stuff. 
<laughs> I like that man. When in doubt, he's always says stuff. The what? The drug delivery. And what concepts did we learn? Differential equations. Yeah, differential non equations. We went not unsteady state mass balances, which brought us to the dreaded ordinary differential equations. Uh, remember we had the little tanks? And then we put a bunch of tanks together and came up with your favorite project for the quarter. And uh, then, uh, after doing unsteady state mass balances, we went to, where'd we go after that? The kidneys. So we did the mathematical model of the kidney. And that took us into mass balances. And we applied that to the artificial kidney. And then Max and I and two of you went over and saw it <laughs> on our great f disastrous field trip. Uh, of, 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 yeah, of which you went out and threw up. And so. <laughs> um, and then where'd we go? Environment. And we went into a uh, couple lectures on the environment. And so we're going to end up with a lecture on drug delivery. Now, in the, in the past, I've given about three lectures on this, sort of ex extended it out. I, I, but I keep adding things to the class and keep shortening other things. So this is one of the ones that got shortened. So I'm going to put this in the context of a, of a true story. Uh, I'm going to take you back in time. Uh, this is from uh, the Pioneer uh, Press, a, min a major min a Minneapolis newspaper, on January 27th, 1998, about 10 years ago, the beginning of a major trial in Minneapolis in which I was an expert witness. Now, to understand how I got there, we have to go back in time two years to Christmas of 1996. I'm sitting at home at my dining room table thinking about E20. And uh, the phone rings, and it's a lawyer named Mike Cerisi. And uh, he says, hey, Channing, I'm in town. Uh, it'd be great if we could get together. Well, I said, Mike, I haven't heard from you in 10 years, since the last trial we were in, where we um, worked to uh, take off the market a number of interuterine devices that were killing women. And uh, one was the Copper 7, and the other was the Dalcon Shield, both of which we litigated off the market in rather spectacular trials uh, that caused worldwide attention. In fact, we actually went to Australia and we found out that many of the IUDs that had been litigated off the market in the United States and were sitting in inventory were then shipped to Australia and sold to women there and killed a number of women. And so we got it out of Australia as well. So it had been 10 years. He calls up and says, can I come back by and see you? Uh, yeah, I said, I'm sitting here thinking about E20, Mike. And so about a half hour later, limo comes up and, oh, God. <laughs> now I, I, I saw that one. <laughs> These guys are doing shots in the front row. Um, <laughs> they want to be sure I get arrested in my last lecture. <laughs> so why don't you here? Why don't you just fall with a little smoke? Uh, gee, many Christmas. That was that's pretty. I'm going to get high. Just oh, oh thanks. <laughs> you know, I, let's wait till after class at least. Uh, things have changed, Howie. Uh, you used to bring me an apple. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We we uh, we we. Uh, good God. So. He, he walks in the house and he said, uh, you know, I'm starting this big case uh, uh, against the tobacco companies. And he said, you know, you're a chemist. I said, no, I'm a chemical engineer. He said, oh, well, it's the same thing. Uh, why would the tobacco companies uh, become very soon the largest purchasers of ammonia in the form of diammonium phosphate or urea? or neat ammonia in the country. Do you have any idea why they would do that? And I'm sitting there thinking, God, no. Cigarettes, um, I said, the only thing I think of is it might have something to do with nicotine. And he says, well, 
work with me. Talk to me about nicotine. So what I brought in here, and I'll, I'll pass this around so you can see it, is a nicotine molecule. So it contains uh, something that looks like a benzene ring, except it has one of the carbons replaced with a nitrogen, the blue. The black are carbons, it's two nitrogens. And how many uh, valence uh, positions are there on nitrogen normally? Three. And you'll notice that on this molecule, I have four atoms or four bonds connected to the nitrogen. So what does that do? This, these whites are hydrogen. So what does that do to the charge on the nitrogen atoms? Plus one. Plus one. So we have two, two positive charges on this molecule of nicotine. Now, uh, nicotine is a base compound because of these nitrogens. It's like atropine. Uh, it's like caffeine. Uh, it, uh, they have these interesting qualities that they're almost equally soluble in water as they are in oil. And so if I put this in an aqueous solution and I begin to add base to it, what happens to these two protons? It deprotonates. And the first one to come off actually is the one that comes off the benzene-like ring to, to stabilize the resonance of the electrons. And this one comes off. So what's the charge on this? Plus one. And if I continue to raise the pH, finally this one comes off. And the charge on this molecule, nicotine, is now? All right, so we've had all possible answers. <laughs> so I started with plus two. I now hold the plus two in this hand. <laughs> two, uh, two minus two turns out to be zero. And this is now a neutral molecule. What do you remember, for those of you, if you can remember, that took biology concerning the kinds of molecules that traverse biological membranes more easily than others. Non-charged molecules tend to be able to traverse biological membranes more easily than charged. So why did the tobacco companies purchase large amounts of ammonia? <laughs> to deprotonate the nicotine and therefore Make it hit you harder. Make it more bioavailable. Now, why would they be doing that other than uh, when I was on trial, uh, the judge says, well, doctor, can you, uh, can you, you just explain deprotonation and charge and electron resonance. Nobody in the courtroom has any idea what you just said. Can you put it in common terms? They said, yeah, crack nicotine. <laughs> they freebased it. He said, oh, I get it. Um, and that's what freebasing is. Uh, it's basically uh, changing the charge on molecules and making them more bioavailable. Now, why would the tobacco companies want to do that? Why do you think they'd want to do that? More bang for the buck. More bang for the buck at a time. By the way, this happened in about 1965. The very time, the very year, a backwater brand took off in sales and rocketed, displacing Winston as the number one cigarette in the country. Do you know what brand that was? Marlboro. Marlboro. This didn't happen because of the friggin' cowboy, <laughs> all three of whom have died of cancer. <laughs> Only three? Well, you know, they lived for a while before they died, and then they got another one. Uh, this was the first time a, a, a tobacco brand had been freebased. Now let's think about what was happening in 1965. First of all, we have to go back in history as to when people started smoking. Does anyone know, um, any guess when people started smoking? The 1600s. A long time ago. And when the Europeans came to this country uh, and they went ashore, they found the Indians uh, growing this 
unusual plant with very large leaves. And they would uh, take these leaves and they'd hang them out until they turned kind of a burnish brown color. Then they'd roll them up and they'd light them on fire and they'd smoke them. And so these were Portuguese sailors. Uh, they took a whole bunch of these plants back on a ship to, to Lisbon. Turns out a number of those sailors died because they were handling these leaves. Nicotine in the form that's in the leaves can easily be absorbed like nitroglycerin through your skin. Uh, besides plutonium, nicotine is probably one of the most toxic chemicals known. It has an LD50 in rats of about 40 uh, milligrams. That means that you know, half the rats will die if they ingest that much. If you were to eat a pack of Marlboro cigarettes, you would kill yourself. Now, most people don't eat them. <laughs> and so there's not a problem. But there is certainly enough nicotine in there to, to kill you. And this is what happened to some of these Portuguese sailors. The uh, ambassador from France to, to uh, Portugal at that time was a guy named Nico, N-I-C-O-T. And he saw the Portuguese beginning to plant this plant and beginning to dry the leaves and roll them up and smoke them. So he took these back to the Pasteur Institute in Paris and said, take a look, see what's in these leaves that seems to be so appealing. And they found this compound, ultimately nicotine, distilled it out, named it after Nico, the ambassador. And they knew that that was the active ingredient in, in tobacco. So if we go forward in time, part of what happened in the South was they not only planted cotton, but they planted vast amounts of, of tobacco. And it was a cottage industry. You'd, you'd grow up the tobacco plant, which by the way, why do you think it has nicotine? I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, if you're a plant and you've got this huge leaf and things can buy a gnaw on you all the time, you'd like to produce a chemical that either kills them or at least turns them away. So it's kind of the equivalent of a, of a plant skunk. And uh, so you can have these big leaves and have all this photosynthesis and uh, people just take a little bite and then they run away. And so it it's, turns out to be a, a natural sort of uh, insecticide, pesticide. And in fact, the only commercial use of nicotine other than in, in smoking products is as an insecticide. So anything that's... Uh... What happens with chewing tobacco? Chewing tobacco, uh, the, you get the same thing. You just get the nicotine a little differently. In chewing tobacco, you get the nicotine through the mucal or buccal membranes in your mouth uh, as opposed to the lungs. So why is it that you can't... Like, if you chew that entire pack of cigarettes, you'll die. And if you chew tobacco, you'll die. It's just less amounts of tobacco that such as you would die. Yeah, I think if you took a wad that big, stuck it in your mouth, and then swallowed it, you know, you don't swallow it, you stick it out. So you don't extract all the nicotine that's there, uh, even when you're chewing tobacco. The nicotine that you extract from a pack of cigarettes, about 15% is all you get. Uh, the rest of it either goes up in smoke or you spit it out or, or it, it, it gets consumed. So you could, in principle, chew enough tobacco to most likely make yourself pretty sick, if not kill yourself. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, you, you do? <laughs> okay, right. You spit it out. Oh, you, you, know, you wash it down with alcohol. Okay, that's, uh, right. we, we have the future health minister of uh, Lower Slobovia here. Uh, now, there's a, that's an interesting thing, too. And from, a, from the reward system point of view, uh, getting uh, nicotine in through chewing tobacco, it goes into your systemic circulation, and then it goes through your liver, which detoxes some of it, and then it goes through your entire circulation before it goes to your brain. So it's much slower acting. Uh, in the lung, the nicotine goes across the membranes of the lung and within six seconds is binding to receptors in your brain. It's a very, very fast hit, uh, much faster. And you get a much spikier concentration profile hitting these receptors, which we now know turns, to re turns out to reinforce them. This is why uh, tobacco uh, patches, you know, nicotine patches, 
tend to work in some people and not in others because it basically titrates the nicotine level in your blood, but it doesn't give you those hits uh, that you get when you uh, puff uh, a burning or combusted tobacco product. Now, you might say, what about cigars? It turns out cigars uh, have, are made with very high pH uh, tobacco, natural pH tobacco. If the, if the pH gets too high, you can't actually inhale the smoke. It, it gives you this gagging reflex as the, as the nicotine hits uh, uh, nerve receptors in the back of your throat. So most people who smoke cigars don't inhale them. Uh, as a result, they don't get quite the nicotine load that you would get through a, a cigarette or a water pipe. If you're from the Middle East, uh, people use water pipes. If you're from India, they smoke things called beaties. If you're from Southeast Asia, they smoke things called cloves. And, and, and so forth. It's the equivalent of menthol cigarettes here in this country where they put flavors in. So anyway, uh, turn of this, let's go back to the turn of the century. This guy named Bannock uh, uh, patents a cigarette making machine, a machine that can actually automate and make cigarettes as opposed to hand rolling them. And it sits in the patent literature until a guy comes along named Duke and sees this patent and licenses from Bannock, a Duke of Duke University, um, which is one reason you don't want to send your kids there. Erase that from the tape, because <laughs> someone, someone from Duke will probably watch this. Uh, so uh, he gets the license for this, and he starts making these machines. And of course, immediately the cottage industry disappears, because no one can make cigarettes as fast as he can. And he gets very rich. And he starts something called the American Tobacco Company. Now, if you remember in the teens, the government started trust busting uh, the oil companies, Standard Oil in particular. Remember, it broke it all up into Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard of Ohio, Standard Oil of California, and so forth. Uh, after that, they went after the tobacco industry, which was the American Tobacco Company. And they broke it up. And they broke it up into the American Tobacco Company, uh, Liggett and Lorillard and allowed foreign companies to come in and sell cigarette products. And that brought in uh, Philip Morris and ultimately Brown and Williamson. And so in, uh, and then ultimately the American company, R.J. Reynolds, got into the business with the Winston brand. So we had basically uh, six uh, companies that were manufacturing most of the, tobacco, most of the uh, cigarettes sold in uh, the United States. Uh, in about 1954, a, a fellow by the name of Widner did an experiment. He shaved the backs of mice, and he blew smoke on the shaved area of the skin, and tumors grew. And he wrote a paper. And he said, you know, there's something in tobacco smoke that tends to promote tumor growth. About uh, six months later, the chief executives and lawyers for these companies met at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Now, this is against antitrust laws, by the way. You're not supposed to do that. Um, they said, this guy just wrote this paper saying that uh, there seems to be a biological consequence, an adverse one, of tobacco smoke. What should we do? And the lawyers said, do you people do any biological work in your laboratories? They all raised their hands, and they said, yes. Well, you know, if you ever discovered that there was any relationship between adverse health effects and smoking, you would have to disclose that. And they go, oh, what do we do? And they said, stop doing biological work in your laboratories. And by the way, any work you do in your laboratories, send to us. And we'll stamp an attorney-client work privilege, and it will never be discoverable. OK, we'll do that. And they went away. And they wrote something called the Frank Statement. Not Frank after the name, but being frank with somebody, saying, and this was published in all the major newspapers in the country, saying, we, the tobacco companies, it has been said that there may be some adverse uh, health consequences to smoking. But we don't know about it. And if we ever discover it, we're going to be the first ones to let you know. That's after they shut down all the labs. And the plan was, let the non-tobacco company scientists, wherever they may be, find this out. And when they do, we will be prepared to call it junk science, uh, not fully credible, unbelievable, 
and having nothing to do with reality. Because remember, we told you, if we find out, we'll let you know. And you can't believe any of these other things that go on out there. Well, the pressure started to mount. More and more evidence came in. The Surgeon General published a report in 1969 saying, you know, cigarette smoke causes lung cancer in men. It was discounted by the tobacco industry as sham, junk science. A bunch of people out to get us. The pressure mounted. They were told they couldn't advertise on radio and television any longer. You know what they did when they heard that? They went and had a huge party. Why? Save money. They didn't have to advertise on radio and TV anymore. And did they really care? No. Because they're consuming a public that is all addicted. They don't have to hear about it on TV and radio. Their body wants this. And then you have all these kids who are underage, learning to smoke through peer pressure. They're seeing their buddies do it, so they try it, and they're immortal. They'll never get addicted. They get addicted, and by the time they figure it out, they can't quit. 90% of the people who smoke want to quit and can't. They try, but it's just not very successful. Yeah, tobacco companies will always tell you about Aunt Edith in Iowa who smoked for 40 years and quit cold turkey the next day. But you know what? She's about 40 sigma out on the distribution. <laughs> um, she, she's not the median, Aunt Emma, <laughs> at all. Um, and for all I know, she has encephalitis and a few other things, and maybe no brain left to have any receptors. <laughs> so, so then the tar wars began. And we called it the tar derby. It began that, well, there's something in cigarette smoke that might uh, uh, cause adverse health consequences. Tobacco companies would never admit to that. But what did they respond by? Well, first of all, they were writing on the boxes something called the amount of tar and nicotine that you get. Now, where did that come from? And what is tar and nicotine? Well, let me tell you how they measure it. <laughs> it's, uh, it it's still uh, sort of phenomenal to me that, you know, I can that this actually happened. So imagine a, um, you have a, a little machine, you stick a cigarette in it, you have a piece of filter paper here, you pull a vacuum periodically, so you have your cigarette burning, it sucks in, catches whatever comes through in the smoke on a filter. So what, what have you done? You weigh the filter, you put it in the machine, you smoke a cigarette, you take the filter out, you weigh it again, you then put the filter in a heater and drive off all the water, and you weigh it again. So now what you're left with is anything that came through the cigarette that was not water. Well, that's tar plus nicotine. So then you take this and you analyze it for nicotine, and what's left is tar. Good. What's tar? Tar is something you put on the road. Can you believe people pick up something that says, so many milligrams of tar? And they say, cool. And so many milligrams of nicotine. A lot of people we find out when we go out think tar is a molecule. <laughs> You know, it's something that you, you, you measure. You know, it's like it's got some carbons and some hydrogen. What it actually is, is about six or 7,000 unidentified compounds as the products of combusting a natural product. I mean, how many people in their right mind are going to go mow their lawn, take the clippings, roll it up, stick it in their mouth, and smoke it? I mean, there's something more to that, right? And it's the nicotine, right? It's the high. It's the addiction that you get. So that's how they, they made the measurement. How does this have, does this look like you? Is this the way you smoke? You know, pulling a vacuum? I mean, it has nothing to do with how much you're going to get. But that's what went on the boxes. So then there was this pressure to reduce tar and nicotine. So the first thing they did is they put filters on cigarettes. Now, they knew that the filters didn't do much. They reduced the tar and nicotine somewhat. But and in fact, almost all cigarettes today have filters on them. But what they did know is that it still dosed you with enough nicotine to addict you. So the perception is it's healthier. 
The reality is you're still going to get addicted and you're still going to buy our product. Well, that wasn't enough. There was this pressure for reduced tar nicotine. But how do the companies make a reduced tar nicotine cigarette without saying that the ones that are high are bad for you? So then all of a sudden, they go from the militaristic Chevron male-oriented cigarette. Don't think that this thing is just some cute little roof line. This is like a badge of courage. They come out with these things, white. Now, do you, does this look safer? Yes. I mean, it's like a hospital, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it's like a doctor's uniform. And this was called Marlboro Lights. The public perception, of course, was that these are safer. So I can smoke these, and I'll live longer than if I smoke these. Now, these, this is, I, when I went to Kobe, Japan, I went up to a vending machine. You can, there's a vending machine every four feet selling cigarettes. And after I figured out how much money to put, turns out I, I'd put in the equivalent of a $100 bill, because I, I couldn't read the currency. And of course, it says this, this machine, and, and it says, what does this line mean? He says, no change. And I said, oh. So this is a $100 pack of cigarettes here from Kobe. So this is mild 7-1. This is mild 7-10 original. It's like Coke, Coke classic. I mean, white, blue. Um, here, here's uh, Benson and Hedges. Can you read that? <laughs> smoking kills on the front. Stopping smoking reduces the risk of fatal heart and lung diseases. You may live longer. Now, what kind of advertising is that? See, they were forced to put this on in the UK. And you know what this created? Just like it did in Canada, where they put pictures of dead babies on, uh, on it is it created another industry, a little industry that made little covers to go over these things with little daisies and little kids playing so that you didn't have to look at this. And in fact, in Canada, you have to go to kiosks to buy cigarettes that are surrounded by pictures of death and mayhem and excised lungs and <laughs> tissue and stuff sitting there. People still go, why do people do that? Because they're addicted. They don't have a, a, a big choice. Then finally, you get to merit. Again, white, ultra light. It's not enough to be light. Now it's ultra light. So what is all that about? Well, this turns out to be one of the greatest scams on earth. And so I would like, um, Michelle, would you like to come up here and be like Vanna White? Do you know who that is? You come up anyway. You can be whatever you want. I, I need you. You look to me like you're a stable young lady, and you've got, you've got very good hands. So come on up here. Um, so here's two cigarettes. Here's a Marlboro, and here's the, uh, the ultra light. Look at that difference. This is the ultra, it's ultra long is what it is. So what I want you to do, Michelle, is just cut this way here and then peel off this paper. Okay. Okay? So it will just peel off if you just, uh, so just cut. Peel. Yeah, just cut all the way down there. Yeah. You may have to cut it. Okay. Now I had, I had one student do this, and she was real quiet, real quiet. And, she was, and then she hands me this bloody mess, <laughs> which was, uh, and I got, oh my god. Take her, take her to the ER. She says, I didn't do well in lab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to feel, okay, good, okay, and what do it want? to the other one too. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna pass this around. This is a filter, this is cellulose acetate. Um, uh, this is brought to you by C the Selenese Corporation and goes on the end of every cigarette. And uh, this is what's called the filter, the, the filter paper. And um, so let's see, who would, who would like to, Emerson, you wanna come up here? You're still awake. Um, so I want you to uh, look at this against the light and tell me what you see. That light, that's a light, Emerson. <laughs> Emerson. My God, it's full of holes. Yeah. 
And you see the yep. two see lines what? of holes. Right two here. lines of holes. Now, you see those, Michelle? Yeah. Two lines of holes? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about here? One, one, little line. one little tiny line with not too many holes, huh? Not as many holes. So after class, you can come up and look at this, because I don't think this projects. The holes are too tiny. Of course, they're meant to be that way. So when these, uh, thank you. Oh, you, want, you can go ahead and pass that around. And then you can also pass, pass these around. You can sort of pick at this so you can see what's inside a cigarette. <laughs> um, so now what's with these, there's holes. Now you can't see those, no consumer can see them at all. Now the Merit Ultralight has two bands of holes, many, many hundreds of holes around them. And the Marlboro has one band with very few holes. So let me go back to this measurement technique. You see, when they started measuring tire nicotine, the FTC, the food Trade Commission said that the tobacco companies, you guys know most about cigarettes, so you make the measurements and report them. And by the way, you design and make the machines that are going to be used to report them. Oh, we'd be happy to. We'd be very happy to. So they made this machine. Now, the way this works is that this machine is such that the, the holes in the filter are out here. So what happens when the machine sucks? What does it pull in here? Fresh air. What does that do? Dilutes. Dilutes the nicotine. When it goes through. Okay, so think about it. Because it'll use more over the whole thing. Like you won't get one little spot. Yeah, but you measure the whole. Okay. Measure the whole thing. And I guess the filter is not 100% active. No, it's not. <laughs> When you put that in your mouth, what do you think happens? Plug the holes. You cover the holes. Okay, so you don't get any of that. So the ventilation of that ultralight is about 90%. So on every puff, you get about 90% air for every 10% of smoke coming through. So the rest of it is burning and going up not in the way you would actually smoke it. And so what does it do to the accuracy of this in terms of relating to what you get when you smoke versus what the machine is reading? Well, so no it, it, it says it takes a longer time to smoke the cigarette than actually Well, this thing actually puffs every 30 seconds. Well, it, because you're putting it into the atmosphere, that means it's not reading the amount that you would actually be taking right. when you put your mouth over it. That's right. So you puff and it burns and it sits there and burns and, it's, and you're not extracting all that uh, nicotine each time. So a lot of that goes up in what's called secondhand smoke or secondary smoke. No, it's just sitting there pulsing. So they figured out that they could actually make a measurement that would falsely give low values that they would then put on these brands called lights, because they could say it has low tar nicotine. But when people smoked them, they didn't know this. They covered the holes. Now, there's, it's even more insidious. Psychologically, they know they're smoking something that's light, but they want more. So they breathe deeper, they hold it longer, and they smoke it harder. We now know that a person smoking ultralights gets more tar and nicotine than a person who smokes full flavor. These turned out to be even more dangerous. And in fact, 
the kinds of cancers that appear now in people's lungs are deep uh, lung uh, adenocarcinomas, which didn't happen uh, with the kinds of lung cancers that uh, occurred first. And it's because the smoking public changed the way they smoke, and that's called compensation. And it's because people smoke to get the hit they want, no matter what it is they smoke. And they fool themselves into thinking that they can get that same hit from these, which they do because of the way they're smoking them. And so this turned out to be probably one of the most egregious lies perpe perpetrated on the consuming public ever. And the tobacco companies not only knew it, they designed it to be that way. So in 1998, or 1994, the heads of these tobacco companies went before Congress and they all raised their right hands and they were asked two questions. Sir, do you have any evidence that your product, that your product causes adverse health effects? No, 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 no idea. Oh my God, no. <laughs> Sir, do you have any idea that nicotine is an addictive pharmacologic drug? No. No, never occurred to me. I don't, no, I don't know. They all lied under oath. And then within weeks, they disappeared from their jobs. They retired. And you might say, why don't they go after these creeps for perjury? Well, perjury is, is, is hard, it turns out, to, to prosecute in courts. And because of that, nobody believed that. It, it just sort of brought to for the sham, but the problem is up until then, nobody knew about this. Nobody knew about these holes. Nobody knew about ventilation. Nobody really understood compensation. So from 1996 to 1998, I and uh, four other uh, folks, an epidemiologist, a nicotine addiction specialist from the Mayo Clinic, uh, a, an antitrust expert, and a child psychologist, all poured through documents that were being discovered in the tobacco company's files. Not a lot of it we didn't discover in the files. We found out that if we went and found people who had worked for tobacco companies, you'd go into Iowa, Dubuque, you'd go and see Uncle Ed, and say, Uncle Ed, did you work for uh, Philip Morris? Oh yeah, I retired about you know, 15 years ago. Did, What'd they make you do? Oh, they told me to clean out my office. What'd you do with your stuff? Oh, it's in a box in the attic. Can I have it? Yes. And that's, of course, in those days, they didn't have email or computers, so they made carbon copies. Your worth was not how many people you put on your email list like it is today. It's how many people you carbon copied. And each one made a piece of hard copy that then people put in their files. And then they ended up taking them home and putting them in their attics when they retired. So we started recovering this. When we, and then we'd go up to the guy at the court and we'd say, Mr. Vice President, here's a memo to you saying that uh, nicotine is a pharmacologically active agent and it's, it's our drug. Oh, I don't remember seeing it. It's, it's written to you. I don't know. And by the way, we didn't find it in your file. I don't know. I don't, I don't keep things. I mean, you know, it, was, it just went on and on like that. So the, uh, we poured through these documents and put this picture together. And my job was to be the cigarette design engineer. Well, I told Mike, I said, I've never designed a cigarette. I never get qualified. But he said, you have uh, worked with Alza, who be became the premier drug delivery company in the world since it started. Yeah, you're a drug delivery expert, right? What are these cigarettes doing? Well, they're delivering a drug, nicotine. Good, you'll get qualified. Because you see, you couldn't get a cigarette designer to testify because the judge, Fitzgerald, had said, you can't have anybody who's worked for a tobacco company testify for the plaintiffs because we don't know if they'll be credible because they might be mad. You know, they might be a, a, a begrudged employee, former employee. And the tobacco companies loved it because they knew they couldn't find anyone who had designed cigarettes that hadn't worked for them. And by the way, when you did a, a search for a cigarette design, you had zero hits, nothing in the open literature. So I sat for a period of about four months in what was called the Formulation Documents Vault. 
This was a room at the top of an office building in downtown Minneapolis that they had strung copper mesh, floor, ceiling, and walls, so that it was electromagnetically secure. And I would go in there. There were two doors. I guarded each door. I was not allowed to take any written material, a pencil or anything. And I walked in, and there's 55 drawer file cabinets with all the formulation documents of all these tobacco companies. It would be like walking into a room, seeing the formula for Coke, Pepsi, 7-Up, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, and, and Jolt. You know, I mean, it would. And of course, they, they were fearful. They didn't want to have see how their tobacco, you know, what tobacco formulations they were using, what they were spraying on tobacco, the fact they were ammoniating tobacco and freebasing it and so forth. So I had to tuck that all away in my head, which was really why my head hurts. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of stuff to sit there and just read and read. And I saw, you know, I would see things like they add levulinic acid. And then I'd run away, I remember that, and I'd go figure out what's levulinic acid to find out it's a nicotine receptor accelerator i mean the stuff that they were putting in there and then i i finally get to the trial and the guy comes at me he says doctor what do you mean we deliver nicotine everybody knows it's in there for the roasty toasty flavor <laughs> and and so this is where the fun began I said, really, the, Mr. Ber now, Mr. Bernick was considered, is considered one of the best defense attorneys uh, in, in, in the country. And um, so I wrote down some quotes here. Uh, uh, um, so I, I actually had the document. So I'd say, well, uh, Mr. Bernick, let me show you this document here. In the case of nicotine, which has taste of foul, rotten rubber. That's not roasty, toasty. <laughs> and in fact, I think what you want is, look, an irritant, it's, an, it's an irritant. It, it, you've got to mask it. It'll knock you out. You can't bother to smell it. I said, it looks to me like it's something you wouldn't want in there. And he said, oh, but doctor, I guess you're not a botanist. Don't you know that nicotine comes on the big leaf? And I said, yeah, and you know what else? Do you know what decaffeinated coffee is? Well, of course, everybody knows what that is, doctor. And I says, well, it's the same kind of molecule. All you do is soak the coffee beans in water, and it comes out, and you get decaffeinated coffee. You can make denicotinized tobacco. And in fact, Philip Morris had a big plant that did that. And the guy's looking now, he's backing up now. And, and by the way, not only that, you tried it. And when you sold it, no one bought it. No one came back. It was called Next. Test marketed in South Dakota, most unsuspecting place in the country. <laughs> right? So erase that from the tape. <laughs> and so, and of course, what they were worried about in reducing tar and nicotine was dropping below what we call the pharmacologic threshold of addiction. They didn't mind telling people, yeah, we're reducing tar, we're reducing nicotine. Yeah, they were going to do that forever until they got to that limit. And they found the limit by taking the nicotine out and then starting to sell this stuff and seeing when people would, would start buying. And so they knew exactly where the pharmacologic threshold was. And they were in this squeeze play of having to reduce it and reduce it, but they didn't want to get to that, you know, to that, to that limit. So this whole business about uh, uh, roasty toasty was just a crock. And so uh, I'll finish up by just telling you the, um, the uh, well, why it's a drug delivery device, because Howie will appreciate this. Every drug delivery device has a platform that holds the device. It has a reservoir that holds the drug, which was the tobacco. It has a portal through which you deliver the drug, which was the open end of the cigarette. It has an energy source that drives the drug from the, the reservoir to the recipient, which was a combination of heat and sucking. And there's a rate controller. And the rate controller in most, if not all, drug delivery devices is preset at the factory and just delivers a constant amount. Cigarettes are the holy grail because the rate controller is the recipient and they control how much they get. So really, it's a very, very good drug delivery system. Exceedingly sophisticated, and they knew it. So 
And by the way, it's very, very simple, isn't it, in construction. You put some tobacco in there, you get a filter, you put some paper around it, and you have machines now. I went to a, a place called Tobaccoville, because I said, I can't testify without seeing a tobacco company. I went to Tobaccoville. It was an R.J. Reynolds operation. I saw cigarette making machines, a hundred of them lined up, each one making 15,000 <coughs> cigarettes a minute with infrared lasers drilling these little microscopic holes in there faster than you could see. We took pictures of this and we couldn't see it because it was ex the machine exceeded the framing rate of the camera. Holy crap. It just turned into a blur. So did they know that they were in the nicotine business? This is what we showed them in the court. These are their own documents. We're in the nicotine business. Our product's nicotine. We're selling a socially acceptable addictive product. The CEOs got up and said, we had no idea about addictiveness. These, these are their own documents. Did they have any idea that it was pharmacologically active? Oh, no. Look at this. Pharmacological action of nicotine, role of nicotine. It's the physiologic satisfaction. Satisfaction is code word for addiction, we found out. Of course they knew it. And they knew they were in the drug delivery business, and they knew they had a really very, very good drug delivery uh, unit. So what happens? Here's the end of the story. It goes to the jury after almost seven months. The jury is really fired up. They've heard all this stuff. They've heard about the greed, the deceit, the lies, the killing, the five million preventable deaths each year in the world. Uh, Enough people die in this country of tobacco-related diseases that's equivalent to five 747s crashing every day. You know, someone would pick up the phone and call Boeing and say, you got a problem with your plane. <laughs> you don't see that with, with the tobacco industry. It's too, uh, too dispersed. So the day it went to the trial, we were asking for $3.3 billion. And that was based on the population of the state of Minnesota for recompense on health care costs. They walked up with a check for $6.6 .6 billion. When you settle, you, bid, you give the judge a check. Boom. Here's $6.6 .6 billion. In hopes that all these documents and all this stuff that had been let out of the bag would all be sealed. Well, when we went to court, we had a machine like this, except it had a television camera here. And it was broadcast to TVs in the courtroom and to the jury. We dropped a little cable off the back, accidentally. Went down through the floor, accidentally, Judge Fitzgerald courtroom, and happened to go onto a server connected to the internet. <laughs> so all these documents were being dumped on the internet for days. And when Judge Fitzgerald learned about this, he says, well, you know, I think the cat's out of the bag. You know, there's nothing much I can do about it, so we'll just let it go. And you can go back to that period of 1998, and you can see all the, all the publicity that started coming out. What? They do what? Well, if you're interested in this, you can check out this article that uh, Richard Hurt, who runs the addiction clinic at the Mayo, and I wrote in October after the trial, the same year, under health, law, and ethics, which is a real great place to be, in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the most widely read medical journal in the world. We never thought we could get this published. We never thought we could get something that had a political, legal, scientific view to it. And we laid out everything we did in that trial and then gave all the references so people could, could lift this banner up. And so what this ended up doing is I got a call from the, from the prime minister of Norway, uh, Brutland at the time, and she said, you know, I'm gonna be the head of the World Health Organization and I want you to come and help write an international treaty on product, uh, tobacco product regulation. And I want you to come to Oslo and I want you to help me select an international group of people to do this. And we did it. And in four years, you know, write a treaty, I didn't learn that in E20. Um, <laughs> we, we, wrote the, we wrote the framework convention, we wrote the, the treaty, we took it to Geneva, it's passed, it's been signed by 170 countries. Uh, it's the most highly signed treaty in the history of treaties since the Magna Carta. Uh, and uh, we are setting up laboratories all over the world to measure emissions from, 
from tobacco products to begin controlling tobacco and tobacco product regulation all across the world. It's been a complete blast. So all I can tell you is that life unfolds for you as a chemical engineer. Very neat things can happen that you wouldn't expect. I mean, never thought I'd spend 10 years of my life and probably another 10 uh, doing this sort of thing. But it was all because of the real simple concepts that you've learned in this class and that you'll learn in the classes that come for those of you that hang on for the ride in, in, in the major, uh, gives you a huge amount of bandwidth uh, to do good things. And I would encourage you all to go out and do very good things. And thanks, it's been a great ride, you guys. All right. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.